Art Movement and the UNESCO Ashberg Program for Artists and Cultural Professionals. I am Rosario Zoraide. I'm the coordinator of the UNESCO Ashberg Program for Artists and Cultural Professionals, and I will be moderating today, today's discussion. I would like to let you know first that the, this discussion is being live streamed uh, in English via Facebook and YouTube and in French and Spanish via Facebook. So you can follow it in the language of your preference. Our guests today are high profile experts and artists from around the world with a diversity of backgrounds and story to share. Our event today will be opened by Mr. Toussaint Tiendre Biogo, Secretary of the UNESCO 2005 Convention on the Protection and the Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, as well as by Mrs. Alexandra Santaki, UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. Mrs. Alexandra Santaki is a leading expert on cultural rights, who has over 50 publications varying from cultural rights of minorities and indigenous people, to cultural diversity, cultural heritage, balancing cultural rights with other rights and interests, and multicultural aspects of international human rights law. As for our distinguished panelists, first we have Mrs. Dia Khan, who will be participating via video message. She's a Norwegian film director born to parents of Pashtun, that is Afghan and Pakistani or origin. She was designated UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Artistic Freedom, and creativity in November 2016. This title was bestowed to her because of her commitment to promoting art as a universal language and force for development, dialogue and social cohesion, as well as for her contribution to building more just and free societies through her work. We also have the pleasure of welcoming Mrs. Golnar Shahyar, an Iranian-Canadian vocalist, composer, and multi-instrumentalist, who's based in Vienna since 2008, where she studied voice and guitar at the University of Music and Performing Arts. Today, she is widely known as one of the most accomplished vocal artists in European contemporary and improvised music. Our third panelist, Mrs. Sahar Dehkan, is also an accomplished Iranian dancer and choreographer. She moved to Paris at an early age where she began her artistic and cultural studies in dance, music, and drama. Among other achievements, she has been the principal dancer of the San Francisco Ballet Afsane, performing dances of the Silk Road, reciting Persian poetry on stage, teaching and creating collaborative choreography. Our fourth panelist is Mrs. Shirley Campbell Barr. She's a Costa Rican poet. She's an anthropologist specialized in African feminism and international cooperation. She's an activist in the Afro-descendant movement and regularly participates in conferences, workshops, and poetry readings, disseminating her work and contributing to the mobilization and awareness processes of Afro-descendant communities. Our final panelist is Mrs. Fatumata Diavate. She's from Mali from Bamako. She has participated in several group and individual exhibitions and has earned a number of awards, notably the Prix Afrique given by the Association Française d'Action Artistique, following her, the 2005 Rencontre Africaine de la Photographie Biennale for her work Touaregs and Gest and Ed and Mouvement. At the end, we will also have a closing performance by Mrs. Niaz Nawab, an Iranian multi-instrumental multi musician, singer, songwriter, composer, and music teacher. And this performance, uh, we are enjoying it thanks to the collaboration of UNESCO with the 360 Paris Music Factory, which we're very thankful for. Please allow me now to give you the floor to Mr. Toussaint Tiendre Vogue, Secretary of UNESCO's 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expression, who will share with us some opening words. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Sorel. Um, this is Sorel, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Assistant Director General for Culture, Mr. Ernesto Otone, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion on resilience in the face of crisis through the lens of women artists on the occasion of the 2023 International Women's Day and organized within the framework of the Resilier Movement and the UNESCO Hushberg Program for Artists and Culture Professionals. In the next two hours, 
we will be discussing women artists' key role in aspiring resilience during crisis and why it is essential to better protect their rights to create as well as their livelihood and em in emerging situations. The voices of women artists matter, but unfortunately, they are still confronted with many specific challenges, such as being at higher risk of experiencing labor precarity, gender-based harassment and prejudices. Women artists and cultural professionals can also be more negatively impacted by crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic, for example, may have taken a disproportionate toll on women artists. However, recovery plans often failed to address their specific needs. Creativity can transform societies. Cultural expressions often question gender stereotypes and restrictive gender-based expectations. The power of women artists is all the more essential during crisis as they draw attention to the issues faced by women and girls while spreading the messages of hope and resilience. Mesdames et Messieurs, la promotion des droits de l'homme... Ladies and gentlemen, the promotion of human rights is at the core of UNESCO's mandate, and our exchanges today bear witness to UNESCO's commitment towards gender equality in the creative sectors, as well as the protection of artists' rights, including artistic freedom. In the framework of this ongoing commitment, the UNESCO Ashberg uh, Program for Artists and Cultural Professionals is the appropriate framework to support the implementation of the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, as well as the uh, 1980 recommendation uh, uh, on the uh, status of the artist. Uh, within the framework of these uh, two texts, we uh, insist on the aspect of gender equality, which, uh, as you know, is one of the two major uh, priorities of this organization. It is increasingly important to raise our voice and to uh, raise awareness as to the importance of protecting and promoting the rights of women artists. And in this framework, our debate today will examine the situation of women's rights, especially women artists' rights, in the world and how we can best support them. I wish us all a very fruitful exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tien Riogo. Before turning to our panelists, I would like to invite Mrs. Alexandra Santaki, UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, to also share her thoughts and opening words with us. Mrs. Santaki, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for such an interesting event um, on, on today, uh, which is a day of celebration, but also a day for reflection. Um, so resilience in the face of crisis is um, uh, through the lens of women artists is the topic of this of this um, uh, panel. Um, and, and indeed, um, conflicts are still seen very often uh, and crises are still seen very often as the terrain of um, male focused uh, work and, and uh, male focused uh, power. Uh, we still see um, uh, wars um, being uh, where women are pushed aside, uh, their concerns, their needs and their contribution. And unfortunately, men are still seen as the main protagonists in these situations. So I cannot get out of my mind the images of Ukrainian women uh, leaving uh, the buses at the, that were portrayed all over the social media um, and, and the news uh, during the first uh, few days of the uh, illegal war in Ukraine. And it was very um, obvious to many of us that women were treated by the media uh, rather than uh, by anyone else as um, the um, th as being in the periphery of, of this war, as not being the protagonists, uh, only being seen as victims. Um, of course, the following few days, um, Ukrainian women living in Ukraine um, made very obvious that uh, this this was not the role they were going to have. 
So I think it is very important that um, female artists are also, in specific, also have a central um, position in, in these situations. Um, it is important to re-emphasize that women have the right to exercise their cultural rights and take freely um, a part in cultural life uh, in equal manner as uh, men. And the international human rights law obligations for that um, states have undertaken uh, to push uh, women to do so. Women artists are very often pushed aside in times of uh, war or are asked to continue to work on um, peace um, themes. Um, um, they are, in, in most countries, women continue to be less represented or recognized in many artistic disciplines, and we can see this in times of war as well. Uh, my mandate has highlighted that in, um, in two reports, um, and, and especially the report on the negative impact of all forms of extremism and fundamentalism. The contribution of female artists in this respect in times of crisis is important. First, it is important because very often they highlight um, the um, they highlight the contribution of women in general in times of war. Who can forget Elsie Gladstone's um, painting depicting a proud female officer during the Second World War, the painting entitled A Woman's Royal Navy Service Officer in um, 1940. Well, she showed the, the female officer sitting proudly on her desk, focusing on the female resilience and expertise. Um, uh, sometimes, um, unfortunately, um, female artists become um, invisible uh, and are being pushed by the elites um, in, in the country to, to be silenced. And we see this uh, in, in uh, um, Iran and um, Afghanistan and in other states at the moment. My mandate is very active and very concerned about these situations. But the second contribution of women, so the first contribution of female artists, is to highlight uh, the contribution of women in general um, in, in these situations. The second, I think, um, uh, importance is the, the implementation of the vision. Female artists show the vision, their dreams for the post-war or post-crisis era. Through their art, they take part in shaping society and, and also shaping the contours of culture. And this is why it is very important that they continue um, to, to have this role next to um, all, all others. Um, my, uh, my mandate has worked on the right of freedom to artistic expression and creativity and how this contributes to self and community building, resilience and hope. Um, and, and I think that um, the, the contribution of um, female artists in this respect is um, very important. I stay um, present. Uh, I am very interested in, in this issue and I am looking forward to the discussion, uh, discussion through words, but also discussion through art um, in, in this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Santaki, for your insightful words and also for your work in, in this domain. Now on to the discussion. I will uh, ask two rounds of questions to each panelist who will have to limit their responses to a maximum of six minutes. The first part of the panel will explore the challenges and issues related to the status of women artists in order to better understand the specificities of the work and their situation, in particular in the context of crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic and conflict situations. So now let's start with our first round of questions. We look forward to hearing your perspectives on such important issues. We will begin with a message from Mrs. Dia Khan, who among other achievements founded Fuse, an independent media and arts production company that profiles stories and voices of women, people from minorities and immigrants to celebrate diversity. We have asked her in particular, in what specific ways do you think women artists and cultural professionals contribute to resilience and healing in the face of crisis? Let us now hear her reply. Thank you. 
I think uh, when it comes to women artists and cultural professionals and how they contribute towards uh, building more resilience and healing in the in the face of crisis, um, I, from a lot of the work that I've done with women artists in different parts of the world, what I have seen most of all is that women artists will often create spaces for connection in the times of crisis. I have seen that women artists will very often work on amplifying the voices of marginalized people. Uh, I also see a tendency for women artists to use art as a tool for processing trauma within their communities um, and through their own work as well. And I also see a lot of women advocating for change. So whether that be social change or political change or cultural change. Um, I think women have often across very many cultures um, a sort of dual position within their communities. On one hand, I think women artists have um, a level of intimacy and connection and trust within their communities that is quite unique and access within their communities um, to minoritized and marginalized groups and also to younger people, which is unique. Um, and I, while at the same time, of course, you know, women are themselves a marginalized group um, and a group that is on the receiving end of a lot of discrimination and harassment and abuse. So I think the combination of the two often, not always, but often opens women artists and cultural workers and the way that they work um, in a way that is conscious of the place that they hold within their communities, but also keeps them very sensitive to the needs of people around them. And I think we see this not just with women artists, we see this with you know women's rights activists, we see this with you know women peace builders. They often become bridges across differences. They often become bridges and points of connection across divisions and fractures within communities. So I think a lot of the work that I see, especially in, in times of intense crises, that women artists and women activists um, sort of step into, the role that they step into often, is that of creating some level of reconciliation, but also a, a kind of return to and a reminder of our humanity and our humanness. So I think um, I think that's a really interesting and a really important place that women occupy within their 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 communities. Uh, especially once their communities are undergoing uh, certain levels of crises, whether it be related to rights or, or um, inequality or environmental degradation. We often see that some of the first responders to a lot of crises are women. And very often, you know, shoulder to shoulder with women activists, um, we see women artists at the forefront of trying to create or trying to create the space for other to create and say what needs to be said and also to create space for what needs to be what needs to be healed and what needs time um, to be expressed and how it is expressed and for, for women to hold that sort of space for their community I think is incredibly valuable and um, underappreciated, I would say, very often. With thanks to Mrs. Khan for her compelling words, I will now turn to Mrs. Shahiar. Mrs. Shahiar, you're passionate about social justice and address important social themes through your music. What can you tell us about the role of women artists as drivers of positive social change, about art as a platform to vehicle messages of resistance and hope, 
as well as the art as a tool to amplify women's voices in the public debate. This is my question to you and I leave the floor to you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, whatever Ms. Khan said, I can only confirm. She uh, mentioned a lot of important things, but like what art and culture is to me in general, and then go further, what women, uh, how women are approaching it. I see art and culture as communication tools communication of our feelings, beliefs, and wishes. Uh, artistic, artistic spaces are spaces uh, where we allow ourselves um, in the best scenario to dream and envision something that is still not there or needs support to become a reality. In art, we practice hope, solidarity, self-trust, community trust, and healing. And through art, we get to be seen and we get to see. In other words, art is the emotional language through which we are granted a chance to understand and respect realities of each other on an emotional level because human beings need an emotional connection to really learn something, to really get it under their skin. It is therefore the utmost importance to uh, uh, have a system that supports that diversity and artistic expression because that not only empowers the person but also their communities or the kind of identity they represent. Um, when we say uh, women, I mean, for sure I see the role of women very present in fighting for this diversity because as Mithran also said, women have been always fighting parallel battles over thousands of years and things have not been handed to them uh, automatically. So they have a sense of what it means to be on the margins, not having any control over the narration. So usually women, because they have this insight, they are more sensitive to issues of marginalized people. And I would like these characters, as also Ms. Khan mentioned, as characteristics that sometimes go beyond gender. I also see men who, who have or fighting for the same for the healing usually the arts but there's always like truly which is a very complex uh, and ever changing concept it goes beyond gender. It goes beyond. Uh, it it involves class. It involves ethnicity. It involves um, um, history. It involves ability, age. Um, also, when we're talking about um, um, diversity in arts, we have to also consider the diversity in the knowledge of the craft, not the people who are doing it, but also the knowledge. Uh, is it diverse enough? Does it have a diverse approach from diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse cultural backgrounds? So all these things. And yes, women, the presence of women uh, do contribute to this diversity, um, but not only. The presence of most of the marginalized people um, who are marginalized based on different systems, let it be an authoritarian system, let it be a colonial, a post-colonial system, what we have in the West. Um, uh, all these people contribute to keep this, our human narration diverse. So I would like to, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is the role of women or the actors the advocates for human um, advocates for the diversity of human expression. Uh, their presence uh, is not only uh, important in the moments of crisis, but also in places where we don't have necessarily crisis, but rather very systematic and chronic problems, such as a very discriminatory system that excludes many others from having access to money resources and etc. I know a lot of uh, female and male and everything in 
in between advocates who are fighting not only in the crisis situation, but also uh, in Europe, uh, trying to open up the space for everybody to have access to uh, empowerment through arts and, and culture. So, yes, do I see more women doing it? Definitely. Uh, when I when I look around in, in such groups, it, they're usually women, yes. But do I also see men uh, around me who understand it and see it as a necessity? Yes, I also see it as a necessity. So I will I will go beyond gender again, as I said, and I would uh, see it as a character or um, or kind of a vision or understanding or rather an approach to life that goes beyond gender. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sahyar. That was very clear, inspiring, and also bringing new dimensions uh, into our discussion. So thank you. And I would now would like to turn to Mrs. Sahar Dehkan. Mrs. Dehkan, most of your work has been influenced by Persian poetry, music, and dance. How do the voices of your peers in your home country continue to affect the content of your work and your ability to create? The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, hear you. sorry. I thought the, the sound was off. <laughs> okay, so before I, I answer the question, I would just like to make a quick introduction. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me the freedom to speak really freely <laughs> because it's it's not every day that we can. Um, women have this, uh, this uh, stereotype of talking too much or having too much opinion. Well, maybe uh, we have something to say that would be great to hear sometimes. <laughs> Um, and actually, I just came just now uh, from a Women's Day event uh, where um, I performed. And at the end of the performance, uh, this woman came up to me and she said, oh, well, you're so much more than a simple dancer. You also speak very good. And I responded to her, I'm like, well, maybe it is because I am a dancer. Because to me, um, artists in general, men or women, or everything in between, as Goldnar says, um, in general, artists have to create, have to innovate, have to be spontaneous, be resilient. Yes, especially in times of crisis, any kind of crisis, everyday crisis. And they have to come up with solutions and innovate right away. And, and so, yes, we, we use a capacity of a brain that maybe, you know, is beyond the, the, the average everyday thing. Um, because I don't know, we work with rhythm, maybe with creativity. I, I have no idea, but I think artists in general are like that. And, um, and so, yes, we should listen to art artists and what they have to say through their art. Yes, but also maybe through speech as well, through writing. Um, and I've seen it also with women that are non artists. A lot of my friends are mothers. And I've seen how much creativity they have every day. They're making art every day with their children because they have crisis every five minutes. They have to come up with a solution and be creative and be innovative on the spot. They have to be re resilient and they, they have to face the crisis right away. So yes, maybe we have it in our genes as women because we're supposed to be mothers eventually. I have no idea bi biologically why it's different, but I have seen men do that as well. Yes. And I think that... I want to go beyond gender as well and make it an artist thing. Yes, we do need artists. We do need art to express um, anything that's related to, to expression, to information, um, because we can say more through art, through emotions. And so, yeah, what's going on in Iran, not just in this movement, but since I've been a child, that's all I've been doing. Why have I focused on Iran? Because first of all, in Iran, you're not allowed to dance. Uh, you weren't allowed to sing until lately, and even that is censored. You weren't allowed to do a lot of um, free speech or, or free any, anything, and still today we're fighting for a lot of that. So, yes, I'm outside of Iran. I was born there. I, I, I left. But now that I am I, outside, I have this freedom to express myself. So I want to use that as much as I can. I want to make it a full-time thing. Yes, so I have been dedicated, dedicating my life to this. And uh, as a dancer, as a poet, as, as many things that I've done in, in all my different projects, I, I, I worked with 
contemporary dance. I worked with digital artists. And it's not just about making something Iranian in my art. Um, yes, I am very much inspired by Persian poetry, Persian music, but I have also worked with other types of music and other, other concepts. And I think what's important is to show that an Iranian woman born in Iran can also be at the same level as a contemporary dancer that's French, that's a man or an American woman, and that it's not about being Iranian or a woman, it's about who you are and, and your character, as Goldnar says. And so um, I get inspired a lot, yes, because of my identity, my culture, and I want to, to show the world what a beautiful, rich civilization we've had for a long time that's being buried more and more every day. And we've been, we're being shut down. And it's, it's so sad because we've had very strong women leaders and men leaders. And today is Women's Day. And what I have to say on Women's Day is that we have a lot of men celebrating Women's Day with us and supporting the fight for women's rights. And an example is also in Iran right now, what's going on is that this movement that we're doing, Women Life Freedom, is not just against men at all. It's We have men along our side. They're risking their lives. They're getting tortured. They're getting executed for women's rights because they're sick of it. They also want to see their sisters, their mothers, their daughters have a better tomorrow. And they're fighting for us as well. And I think a lot of men around the world are doing that. And if, if we don't acknowledge that, then it's all lost because by acknowledging it, it becomes what's happening, what's what's a fact. And so maybe more men will tag along. And so through my art, this is what I do when I talk about it, when I dance, when I create a show. Um, it's, it's about this. It's about, yes, um, there's some identity in me that's cultural, but more than that, it's the everyday contemporary expression that I want to say in my art. So today, that's what I'm saying in my dance is is what's happening now. It's this beautiful unity and we're fighting for something that's greater. And I think if we all unite, it's much better than if we fight against each other. So woman power, yes, but woman power alongside with men is even better. And so, um, yeah, I believe in unity and that's, that's what I'm expressing through my art. And I'm very inspired by the Iranian women today back home who are on the streets risking their lives alongside with our brothers. And I hope that more and more men uh, get along, get on board as well. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dehan, for freely expressing such compelling words. And uh, I will now um, turn to Mrs. Shirley Campbell Barr. I will switch to Spanish, uh, my native language. So, uh, Senora Campbell Barr. Ms. Campbell Barr. You have published dozens of poems, interviews, and articles in magazines, anthologies, and newspapers in many countries. Some of your work has been translated into English, French, and Portuguese. Could you please tell us what inspired you to become a poet in the first place, and how does your activism shape your artistic endeavors? Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. It is an honor for me to be here with you today, celebrating, of course, today we are celebrating International Women's Day. It's a day where we commemorate all of these those who have struggled before us and to maintain our strength for the ongoing struggle. But today we are here to celebrate. Now, I'm grateful to UNESCO for having given me the opportunity to be here, and the I'm also grateful for the opportunity to be a poet, to be the voice for so many others who, in a variety of ways, don't really have a way to speak out. Poesy, poetry is a bit that. My poetry raises the voice of those who see injustice and want to change it. I try to open the eyes of others, and not just women, but all other people. Now, as an Afro-descendant woman in Latin America, I have my own perspective. I've been writing for many, many years, but I think that activism is a way of uh, getting meaning through words. When you understand just how many Afro-descendant women and how many Afro-descendant people have the possibility to 
use words to write with words, you see that there aren't that many people who have access to that. So you start to realize that activism is just part of a much bigger process and broader process. Now, how does my activism influence my art? Well. I think everything merges together. When you understand where you're from, where you're coming from, where you understand your history, where you understand the historical epoch in which、uh, you were destined to be born into and live in, well, that is obviously going to have an impact directly on your work, and that is something that's very important to me. I try to reflect, to be in a mirror image, as it were, of what's going on. I mean, we have to try to. It's a responsibility to actually set down our stories in writing. To represent these other voices, and that's really a responsibility. At least that's the way I conceive of it. So I really feel the need to, to be part of something bigger. In Latin America, let's say there are 160 or 180 million Afro descendants. Half of them are women, and we know, as Afro descendant women in Latin America, that.、Uh, Poetry and Latin and literature is not necessarily something that most women like me have had access to, and this is something that applies to many of our other rights. For example, you know, I mean, actually, literature opens the gate to a fundamental right, which is the right to express one's own personal story. So, activism is only part of the struggle, as I said before. I recognize myself as a black woman, and as such, I am to a certain extent part of a much larger group—a group whose voices have been silenced for centuries and centuries during the diaspora. And so, as a member of the diaspora, I feel like I have a historic responsibility to speak out on behalf of those who have no voice. I'm not claiming to speak on behalf of anybody, but I'm speaking in my own voice, and I'm sure that through my voice, there are other women, other black women. Or women who are not black still, nonetheless, can identify with our writing. Now, in times of crisis, we Afro-descendant women in our region are facing and have always been facing crises day in day out forever, with、uh, forced displacements、uh, for as long as we've been the heads of household, where we've had to be helping the children, the teenagers with their homework, etc., etc., etc. I mean, I could go down the long list of all the things that we do. So, crisis is something that we contend with every single day. In、uh, the African diaspora in Latin America, so I think that being a poet and joining it with activism, it's again both are just part of the overall process, as part of a community, as part of an, an entire historical heritage and ancestral heritage. I feel like my voice is a worthy voice of Black women, and it's therefore important for us. And a responsibility to te- speak about this, and to speak about the constant crises that we have been contending with day in day out,、uh, because of the history that's been imposed upon us. So we have to speak out. We have to say that activism again is only part of this.、Um, poetry can be part of that, but、uh, activism really is a historical responsibility that I bear as a black woman. Thank you very much, Ms. Campbellbar, for your sharing your perspective with us. And now, I shall now turn towards you, Madam Fatoumata Diabaté. You produced a photo、uh, exhibit on the food crisis in Niger, as well as one on tests for vaccines. In the Ebola crisis in Mali, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, you were inspired by others to see how they were using their creativity to contend with the virus. You've developed a series that focused on how African masks、uh, and the tradition of African masks influenced、uh, masks to fight against、uh, the spread of the virus, sur- surgical masks. So, could you please speak to us on the basis of? The work that you have done, and how all of this has inspired your work as a photographer. Thank you very much, Rosario. Thank you very much for this fantastic opportunity, where artists get to share their voices. Nobody knows us better than we know ourselves, of course, in the artistic community. Now, the impact that my work might have. Is mostly in terms of raising awareness. 
And then sometimes I'll focus on small details that people will overlook. For example, I'm very keen on conservation because I come from a country where these values steeped in cultural diversity and nothing should be overlooked in Mali. Every object has intrinsic value, has meaning in my country. It, every, everything contains power. So what I try to do in my in my pictures is I try to focus on youth and on women. These are two groups of uh, members in society that often are somehow not given the same respect in where I come from. So I'm sort of their spokesperson. And during my coverage of the food crisis, I was with Oxfam visiting villages in Niger, focusing on talking with uh, the people in Niger who were having financial difficulties in order to meet their requirements because they'd had a drought. So there was foreign aid that was coming in to provide them with support and to enable them to till their fields so that they could keep their farms going. The Ebola uh, work was also work that was commissioned by the Bill Gates Foundation. They asked me to do coverage on the Ebola vaccination that they sent to Mali to help the state in Mali face that crisis. Now, when it comes to COVID-19, as you all know, we were all locked up at home. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. So I was on social media a lot, and that gave me a lot of inspiration because when I see other people putting on masks that they made with just whatever was handy because they didn't have surgical masks, but people still had to cover themselves and protect themselves, so people used whatever they had at hand, and this provided good protection. I think that's very important to see how this can reflect each of our different cultural values and principles. For us, masks in Africa, they're, they're objects of uh, protection, uh, of spirituality. So this was a way that people were able to come out of this uh, safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madame Diabaté, for sharing your story and for those beautiful pictures. They really show the resilience of your society in faced with, when faced with crisis, and that's something that's uh, very, very important in today's discussion of the resilience of women artists. Now, having heard what you've had to say, I will now give the floor to the, or move on to the second segment of our panel. Um, invite us to turn our gaze into the future. The future of women artists, including in emergency situations and beyond, and uh, on ways to better protect their rights. So uh, to begin with this, the second part of the panel, we have asked Mrs. Diyakan the following question. We asked her, we know that inequalities based on gender persist in the cultural and creative industries. Now, how can, how can we better address the specific needs of female artists and cultural professionals? So here's what she had to say. So we obviously see that um, inequality based on gender still persists within the cultural and creative industries. And I think some of the, the core challenges that women artists still face um, are uh, unequal pay. Uh, I think underrepresentation. Uh, I think that women are often under underrepresented within um, leadership positions, within cultural institutions, uh, within artistic um, institutions and and various artistic and creative fields, whether it is you know women film directors, whether it is music composers, whether it is um, uh, women running their own uh, companies, production companies, for example, or record companies or artist management companies. 
So I think that's very important um, to look at. And then obviously there's a lack of recognition for women's work within the cultural and creative industries. Um, there is the issue of harassment and discrimination, uh, which we need far more robust um, uh, responses for. And then um, there is the limited access to funding and resources. So we don't see to the extent that we should women artists getting to develop and flourish and create some of the works and develop some of the works that they would like to simply because they don't have the access to to the resources to to do the work and then i think we also need to look at the fact that you know a lot of young women and girls um are not allowed they're simply not allowed to enter these spaces they're not allowed to engage with some of these professions because some of these professions would be within their context and their communities considered immoral and dishonorable. And so women are um, either pushed out from engaging in work like this or they're not allowed to enter in the first place. Um, so I think that's something really important also to look at, that we have very large numbers of young women and girls who are simply erased from any possibility of getting to participate. Uh, so I think some of the, the solutions that we need to look at for some of these challenges is obviously we need to provide equal access to resources and opportunities. Uh, we need to promote, I think, diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think that you know addressing issues related to what people would call um, sort of a work-life balance for women artists is, is a conversation that's that's a really important one to be had as well. I think a lot of our professions, um, you know, even myself as a, as a filmmaker, as a, as a director, um, the kind of punishing um, work schedules and travel schedules that I typically work with, having children is, is a huge challenge within that. So we see often a lot of women, uh, many women I've spoken to, for example, within the film industry, who stop directing, who stop making films because they can't, there is no support for them. There are no networks or communities that they can lean on to be able to both do their work and also be available uh, for their family, for their children. So that's something to, to I think, uh, really look closely at. Um, and then I think, you know, issues related to harassment and discrimination is something that we really, really need to take very seriously and, and, and come up with far more robust solutions around. And then I think, you know, overall, we need to be taking seriously the promotion and support uh, for women's freedom of speech, for women's freedom of creativity, for women's freedom of artistic expression. I think what we often forget is that you know women artists and creators face all the same challenges that their male counterparts face whether it is the risk of imprisonment for example um the the challenges of censorship the the risks of of, of violence or harassment or um being punished in other ways for for one's creative work but on top of all of that what women also face, which their male counterparts do not face, is is the risk of sexual violence as well, and sexual harassment, um, and rape, and threats of rape, um, both online and offline. And so I think it's very important that we take seriously the fact that women face uh, gendered forms of violence and harassment towards them for expressing their opinions and for creating their work and for for in some cases, just daring to be a woman and to choose professions within the creative industries. So I think far more understanding um, and support needs to be made available for, for women. And I think beyond everything, we also need to look at solidarity when it comes to women artists, because we are consistently losing a lot of women artists to all the challenges that I've just mentioned because of that, but also because, you know, the cultural acceptability of women to engage in some of these professions uh, isn't always there. And so I think it's, I think it's important that we know that. And I think it's important that we factor in that we are not as a society getting access to all the talent that exists 
amongst women simply because they are women and they are discouraged from even pursuing or these professions or even thinking that they are allowed to even dream about entering these spaces. Um, so I think that's that's something that, that we really need um, to think more about. And I think we must not forget about the importance of supporting and promoting um, freedom of artistic expression for women artists, because it's without that, that there is nothing. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Khan, for, for Mrs. Khan, for giving us uh, so much food for thought. I will now uh, turn to Mrs. Shahyar. My next question is for you. And I would like to ask you, as an Iranian artist who has been established in Austria for several years, what could be done to improve the conditions of women artists who choose or who are even constrained to relocate to a foreign country in order to support their artistic creation? Based on your experience, what do you think, what do you wish could have been different? The floor is yours. Thank you so much. This is actually a very deep and complex topic that needs definitely hours and hours, if hours or hours, years of discussion. So let me emphasis on the fact that I see everything more complex than gender. It's always the question of class. It's always the question of race. It's always a question of ethnicity. Um, and it's always uh, depend which discipline, in which country, in which region. So it's very hard to generalize everything under uh, gender. We're, uh, when we're talking about diversity and giving space to freedom of expression and its diversity, we should always, always, always take the complexity of the situation into account. We cannot always uh, uh, write a formula for the crisis region and apply it to somewhere else. Each region requires their own specific um, uh, uh, solutions and, and have their own problematics. So uh, I truly believe uh, feminism, true feminism, because it's Women's Day, I'm going to emphasize on that, true feminism embraces the complexity of diversity and understands its changing meaning. So let's talk, talk with this lens, with the intersectional lens. I would um, um, always uh, welcome, and actually I'm an advocate for any kind of assistance and help for any kind of artist, especially for women, because they experience multiple layers of suppression, but also women from different classes, from different ethnicities and races, and also men, and also from, uh, from the queer community. Always, we always have to talk like this to make sure we are talking about whole problem, um, to be, get close a little bit to the reality of it. Um, I always advocate for any immediate help that help any artist that is under threat of, of execution, death threats, or any other social constraints at their home country if they're dealing with an authoritarian regime. Uh, we are living in a, in a relative, relative democracy uh, where we're not getting killed because of expressing ourselves. So we have this uh, opportunity to help people who might get killed. <laughs> it's, it's a very immediate solution that has to be there if we do believe in Uh, supporting human rights and activism for everybody. There's, however, another very, very, very important issue here, and that is the acute and systematic problems we have in the West that is formed based on our colonial history. Now, imagine these people are coming into the host countries where there is, uh, there, there is freedom for them to express themselves. Is there any scene and any industry that is able to integrate them as who they are? Or are they going to be integrated as the other or as the victim who actually doesn't have so much power to form their narration? This is what we have in, in Europe. Of course, country to country is different. Discipline to discipline is different. Um, for example, this kind of approach is very strong in 
the more um, traditionalists a scene is, the stronger these problems. The younger the scene, the better they have for understanding of diversity and they accept people for who they are. But they, the more traditionalist the system of that discipline is, for example, in classical music, classical European music, in my case, because I'm specializing in music, the more problematic we have, the more structural discrimination and racism we have in the practice of that music. So um, I am against any project that I always call the charity project that uh, puts the artists, represents it, as the other or as the victim. This model that we have, and it's very widespread in Europe, is not a sustainable model and does not truly give voice and the freedom of expression to the people who we're trying to help out because there's already a very defined definition for them. There is no foundation for them to sustain their li livelihood through their arts. And by foundation, I mean... Uh, so by sustaining i mean financially we're talking about money we don't have a system in europe that integrates these not, uh, artists for their knowledge we don't have so much um even their knowledge usually don't get recognized as a valuable knowledge because it is not based on the aesthetics and understandings of what we have of, of high culture so um what i'm saying is that yes we need to help artists who are in crisis situations, but we have huge problems here in Europe. We need to sit down and talk about them. These problems are very di complex. Again, I emphasize each discipline is different and each genre is different. What I am against is to put these artists in a special separate genre of the other, usually in the case of music is world music which doesn't even care who they come from. They just put them all in a box and they represent them. Um, and usually these kinds of projects and spaces have a separate money, financial resource, right? So what I'm saying is that we need to have diversity in the space, in the positions that distribute resource and space and money to the arts in general, we need to have diversity there in order to give that money fairly to different genres. We don't have that now. Um, what we have is, um, let me collect my thoughts. I lost, uh, I lost myself here. Let me just read what I wrote here. We need to diversify the power positions where decisions are made for space and money. We need to divide the resources based on our democratic values and not based on a system that has been unchallenged since 200 years. And again, I'm going, emphasizing discipline, discipline is different. Keeping the other artists, the other, in a separate space dedicating to the victimhood and disadvantage does not help. We need to open our universities to diverse forms of artistic expressions that have been systematically excluded and devalued in our education system. We need to redefine our industry. Uh, what, are, what is our interest industry? Festivals, venues, agencies, labels, media, all, all these create uh, you know, an industry. They don't work diverse enough. Diversity is always a charity project for them. So we need to uh, redefine that to support and empower this diversity, uh, diversity as one of them, not as so some separate entity. We need to talk more about these issues that um practicing diversity in arts is practicing democracy for representation matters and empowers we need more discourses like this in public we need to empower the independent scene and i'm emphasizing we need to pay attention to the independent scene why because the independent scene is the closest we have that mirrors the reality of our community the independent scene generally let it be marginalized musician, artist, migrant, uh, whatever, the independent scene is struggling enormously right now. We have the problem of sustaining a lot of independent and free-thinking artists in the independent scene. So we need to find ways to empower independent scene and artists who are free-thinkers and are brave enough to risk it all over a long period of time 
We need to empower visionaries, but also community builders. We need to shift our understanding of what art and high culture is and truly embrace the meaning of art and music as communication tools for creating solidarity and trust in the, in the community. For all of that, we need lobbying on the political level to keep the art and music ecosystem healthy, alive and thriving for as many people as possible. Let's not forget art is a language through which we could either feel included or excluded, feel empowered or erased. Let us embrace the fact that arts and music could be our chance to envision and experience, even for a short time, a different reality with one another. So please, let's embrace the complexity of, of the situation and let's talk together because um, we need art, as we all know. We need art for healing and times are uh, becoming more polarized in our society than in our, in our reality. So we need to get together and see what we can do about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Jahyar, for trying to summarize uh, a very complex issues, uh, very important points, uh, including the intersectional approach to the protection of artists going beyond gender and thinking about other layers. The target, the need for targeted, no size fit all responses to the issues and the challenges, not only in the countries that artists may be relocating from, but also uh, in host countries, and the role of art uh, in general. And I think you anticipated, you know, the, a lot of uh, the final messages that that we we may want to take home after this debate. So thank you very much, and I will now uh, turn to Mrs. Sahar Dehan to build up on, on, on what has been said already. And as an artist, uh, Mrs. Sahar Dehnam, in your opinion, what changes need to happen to better protect the voices of women artists in crisis situations? So let us hear your perspective on this. Hello. So um, going uh, to speak after Golnar's incredible speech, <laughs> I, I don't know what else I could add. <laughs> And I, I don't have any notes or anything, so um, I'm just going to be spontaneous here. Uh, I guess I, I would just talk about my own case. Um, uh, I definitely consider myself independent forever. Uh, I have been part of some companies like when I was 17 years old, uh, but otherwise always been independent, always have uh, created independent uh artwork and have had an independent way of thinking for sure definitely uh, <laughs> uh what do you call it uh, outcast um especially from my community um there's two issues i guess i could maybe add to this um this already really complete speech of golnar um please people see this afterwards it was very detailed and very good um I would say uh, one uh, is that uh, I would, would like to talk about entertainment versus art and the money that goes for entertainment today. Um, I have nothing against entertainment. Uh, of course, we all need it, especially in hard times, but it's two different things. And um, I think people today are losing the difference, the judgment uh, difference between arts and entertainment. And more and more artists, especially independent artists, especially people coming from different cultural backgrounds, um, bringing in a whole tradition with them um, that the, they, they've learned their whole life and they practice their whole life with amazing masters from different countries, uh, talking about musicians, dancers, poets, whatever, singers. Um, and they have to give all that up because today what works is the little 19 year old on Instagram that's just uh, doing a selfie and, and she gets 2 million views and a lot of commercials and the money goes to that. And so um, that's something that's of course relevant to women and men, but I think it's even probably worse for women these days because if you come, uh, let's say as an Indian classical dancer or as a Iranian Persian classical dancer, and you want to show something cultural, traditional with Persian poetry, with Indian songs. Um, and you're compared to somebody that's, you know, that that's wearing a very uh, sexy clothes and just wants to do some five minute entertainment or not even 15 seconds entertainment. You have to compete with that. 
And so I think we need help for this. We need help to be able to practice our arts the way we want to and, um, you know, use our, our experience, our, uh, our wisdom, I would say, the wisdom we got from our ancestors, from our masters, from tradition, from culture, and uh, from life experience. I mean, I've, I, I don't know if uh, I'm any good at what I do, but I have a lot of experience and a lot of things to share with newcomers that I would love to share with younger women today. And, um, you know, they would rather learn stuff on YouTube versus coming and learning from me. I'm not saying I could teach them all, but I can pass on some things that maybe they couldn't get in the entertainment industry. And so I would like to have access to that and help with that. Um, for example, with the Sufi dancing also, that's, that's another subject I, I could add. Um, I've had what this, this thing that we were talking about that women have, uh, to deal with that men don't deal with as much. First of all, when I started, uh, practicing Sufi dance, uh, which I, I call Sama, I don't call it Sufi dance myself, um, whirling, uh, only men were doing it when I started. The, the first time I, I started was 1998 and there was no woman in the world that did that. Uh, at least not in public, maybe in, in Khaneros, in temples, or maybe in, in their living room, but not on stage. And so I had to deal with that kind of pressure from society, not just from men, even women uh, were telling me that this was not something you should present in public as a woman. And I, I had to deal with that. And um, later on, I became a choreographer, a director. Uh, I did a, a short film with dance and um quantum and, and astronomy about black holes and just the subject alone people were like wait a woman is doing that <laughs> and uh, I was directing a team of 25 people mostly men only one woman who was the musician and uh, people were not looking up to me or respecting me as they would respect a man and, and I had to deal with that yes but it wasn't because um just because I was a woman, I think it was those specific people in that team. Um, and I cannot generalize that because today I meet more and more men that, that do look up to my work, that do respect me as a director. So it's happening. It's possible. So these are the two things I would ask. One is the respect for art and not just entertainment and the support for that from whoever can give support to that, whether it's financial support or just media support, just make a big deal out of it, please. And don't let all these incredible artists disappear. And the second one is for men to be okay with an, a woman artist directing them, proposing ideas, creating with them, for them. Um, yeah, I guess these would be the, the two main things. And oh, third one. <laughs> that I think Golnar didn't mention, maybe she did, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure she, 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 she could mention it better than I could. But um, uh, talking about our community, our Iranian community especially, um, lately I've had to deal with um, watching comments online on social media about some of these concerts that we did and some of these shows that we did as if we were doing parties. And... Um, that's very important to mention here. I'm not sure if it's related to the question anymore. It's not just about women. It goes way beyond gender. But I really want to mention this right now, is that we are doing this to help the situation in crisis. We're doing this to keep the media interested. So when we do a solidarity concert, not only do we raise funds and it helps, for example, the one we did at the... Trianon Theater in Paris in December, thanks to Barrier Collective, the funds went to um, Article 19 organization that helps give internet access to Iranians in Iran. Uh, another one I just did in end of January at the Triton was uh, for Amnesty International. So these funds go places and it helps. It's not for nothing. And then more than that, the, the journalists stay involved. And they wouldn't if it wasn't for the arts, because there's so much protest that they can go to and film and take pictures. After a while, the, the wave, the fashion of the movement is dead for journalism. Unless artists keep making songs, unless artists keep making dances, films, poetry. So we do need the art and we're not just, you know, partying silently. We are loud out there and the loudest voice is through art. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you don't need uh, notes. That was uh, very complimentary to what um, Golnar said. And it comes from your personal perspective. We can see that it was a very heartfelt testimony as someone who has uh, direct experience in, in um, going beyond uh, and breaking restrictive gender expectations. You also brought up the issues uh, related uh, to arts entertainment and and the preservation also of, of, uh, of uh, the, the type of art that you have been doing. Uh, and um, also the linkages between artists and the media, very uh, complementary uh, to the perspectives we have heard so far. And it brought uh, new elements into our discussion. So thank you very much. You again, you don't need uh, notes to make some excellent points. And I will now uh, turn to, uh, thank you. And I will turn to uh, Mrs. Campbell Barr, Senora Shirley Campbell Barr. I will switch to Spanish. So, Ms. Campbell Barr, my question is, what advice would you give to young women who would like to follow in your footsteps as, a, as a artists and activists? How can you guarantee that uh, women can uh, choose these careers and receive support for them? Well, thank you very much. I think that we need to start from states. I think that there is still the idea that this is a luxury, that it is for the elites. Uh, for instance, if you look at literature, and I think that your question is about incentives. Uh, at the end of the day, women are busy um, solving life problems. And if you want to indulge in literature, then you need time. You need time, but you also need incentives. You need training to be able to exercise these professions. And therefore, my first advice would be dare. Dare to talk about your uh, own stories, about yourselves, and to say, we are here from the point of view of uh, literature. I think that we need to understand how important it is that we can tell our own stories, how important it is uh, to uh, say that we do not just want to be counted, we want to be part of change, we want to participate. And we also need to understand that as women, we become stronger through telling our stories and um, uh, sharing them. Uh, it is also a, a healthy exercise to look into ourselves and to write ourselves, to find ourselves, because we look to our past. And if I look at Latin America in particular, if you look at the number of women who write, the number of women who have written, and the lack of visibility of those women who have written, we understand the importance of this literary exercise. And not only literary, uh, not only fiction, but uh, also um, researching our own histories. That is also a, an academic approach, and today we can see it. If you go to a library, if you start counting, uh, if you start researching the number of books written by black women in any genre, uh, uh, academic research, literary, literary exercises, fictions, poetry, um, chronicles, whatever. Not only do you have a much smaller amount, but um, the visibility of them is limited. So my first advice would be dare and also denounce Denounce what is going wrong. Denounce those elements that we who are on that path encounter every day. The invisibility uh, that we encounter. The negation of our 
contribution to our national entities, the invisibility of those contributions that are there, that exist, and have existed. But, as in any discipline, as in any profession, in fact, the uh, contribution of women, the participation of women, especially indigenous women, black women, and other marginalized uh, uh, groups, is not visible. And I think the most important point is that we should dare. Right. And demand your space. I think it is important to denounce through art in general and specifically in literature. I mean, art to me is a, a, a form of uh, being in the world and denouncing and saying we are here. And literature is one of uh, the easiest to use to denounce because you use words. So what you say is immediately visible in literature. So we need to dare. We need to denounce. Anyone who wishes to write needs to understand that literature is also a, a, a health exercise. It is uh, entering into yourself, understanding yourself. And that is how you can also communicate with the rest of the world. So uh, there is a, a matter of spaces. There is a matter of resources. Because at the end of the day, when you see that black communities, for instance, but also indigenous communities, are marginalized, they are the poorest among the poor in Latin America and in the diaspora. And then it is clear that choosing literature uh, is an act of bravery. It's an act of bravery, but it also requires incentives because it isn't that simple. You can't just decide you're going to write. Uh, you, you can write. You must write and use it as a form of denunciation. And the more, the more of us choose that path, the more visible we will be because uh, awareness is raising on issues of uh, people of African descent. Uh, it is increasingly on the table in our states, in our countries, in our organization, the issue of racism and uh, uh, the uh, issues that affect um, people of African descent, women of African descent and ourselves. M the more of us take the floor and take literature as an instrument for, uh, for our claims, for visibility, then the more visible the whole process will be as well as our voices. And I would say my advice to, to authors, but also the fact that we need support. And, and a previous panelist, Golnar, was saying the same thing. We need support. And Sahar was saying the same thing. Support for arts is fundamental. And in times of crisis, and in any other time, but in times of crisis, it is fundamental. It is the way in which we look at the world, in which we find one another, in the way we can heal and claim our histories that are historically invisible. So I think we need to dare, we need to write, we need to speak by saying, by daring, by telling, by writing, by uh, looking at our stories and, and, and speaking and shouting, then our voices will be heard. And in order to do this, we must denounce and demand more support for our work. Women of African descent need that support. It is, of course, uh, otherwise more difficult to dare, to believe that you can. If you look at the number of women of African descent who've been published, well, you don't need to search very far to realize that the number is extremely low. And this uh, has to do with the conditions of survival that we are engaged in, the difficulties that we encounter to write, to say, to speak. And let me end by saying that this is not only for literature. Uh, we of African descent know that art is fundamental 
to our identities. We always engage in art. We are storytellers. Perhaps we don't write it down, we don't publish it, but we are storytellers. We sing. We dance. Our identity is expressed through art. And so art must also be part of our life. We must reinvent our economies. Countries need to reinvent their economies to ensure that art is part of something that will allow survival. We produce art, we produce literature, not necessarily in book form, but we produce and we, are, we do not get remuneration. And others have benefited from our cultural contributions. We're talking about cultural appropriation. Uh, we've been discussing this for a long time, but it is increasingly important if you recognize that these peoples historically have contributed to the cultural identities of our countries and we have not benefited from it, have not benefited from this ongoing artistic and cultural production, in, in my own case, literary. So I think we, we need to dare, we need to dare to denounce, we need to speak, we need to shout, uh, we need to raise our voices for the, all those who are like us, but for all women. Because these are uh, long-time struggles and we are gaining spaces to raise our voices, to denounce in literature, in dance, in cinema, in theater, in all of these disciplines that are visible, that can be seen. And as we become visible as women of African descent, as women in general, who've been behind the curtain We are seen, but yet we are not seen. We are seen, but we are not recognized. And so it is time to dare and to dare to denounce. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Campbell Barr, for those inspiring words. Calling upon new artists to work and insisting on the importance of visibility for the work of artists of women artists, but also through that work to give visibility to entire segments of the population whose contribution and role in society are not sufficiently visible, who are marginalized. Thank you very much for that contribution and thank you also for discussing the uh, important role of artists in, in denouncing and also in healing and also the bravery. Uh, implied in playing that role, the difficulties it involves, and therefore the support uh, that uh, needs to be provided to uh, uh, women artists and to, to artists in general. So thank you very much. Now, let me move to French. And I would now like to put a question to Ms. Fatoumata Diabate. Now, you um, pre uh, presented a, uh, a photo uh, a report on uh, Mali in uh, uh, women in Mali and participated in a collective project near Lenny uh, with uh, um, subjects concerning Mali and also universal subjects. Uh, And we're going to be seeing some of the pictures while I put my question. For the future, what are your hopes for the upcoming uh, generation of uh, women photographers in your country and how they can uh, also uh, help to shape the sector? You have the floor. Fatumata, vous nous entendez? Fatumata, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Absolutely, you can go ahead. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, got your uh, last sentence. Apologies. Uh, the question is, what are your hopes for the upcoming generation of uh, uh, women photographers in your country and the way in which they can shape the sector, how can they contribute 
to uh, shaping uh, the um, sector in which you work. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I've been working on women in, in Mali with the Quai Branly Museum in Paris. Since I started as a photographer, my financial income mainly comes from abroad, which is uh, which is unfortunate. I hope I can I can uh, live of my art in Mali. As to the future of photography, as a professional in the sector uh, for some time now. I uh, tried to participate uh, in a, opening a training school in photography in Bamako. We don't have one yet to uh, ensure that women and girls can train in photography but also video so that they can be independent financially uh, and um, to uh, indulge in their passion uh, as photography. So that to me is the future. So I've started drafting the project, we're finalizing it and we're now looking for donors to try to set up in Western Africa an international um, school for a digital art photography. So that is what I hope uh, to provide as a contribution to these young women who would like to follow in my footsteps. It's not an easy job. You really need to be passionate about it. You need to have good training. I, I was uh, lucky to have good training, good professional training over a number of years. In Bamako, there was uh, a training center in photography that had been set up by uh, Switzerland, and I was selected to follow uh, training, uh, vocational training. So I am one of those examples today. And concerning your question, uh, I would like to perhaps turn my camera because I happen to be in the exhibition room. So I'd like perhaps to, uh, to, to show you, I don't know whether I can do that, ch ch turn around my camera and show you this exhibition room. Well, yes, go, go ahead. Uh, right, there we go. So uh, I think it's gone now. Okay, voila. That's it. So this is the exhibition room that was opened yesterday. Uh, it was inaugurated yesterday. And as I said in my previous response, I work a lot on the cause of women and women's responsibilities. Uh, women in Mali have a lot of tasks to accomplish as women. Some of them are lighter, easier, and others are not. And so this is work that I did on daily objects. And I was inspired uh, by a visit to Colombia. I visited a, an art gallery in Bogota, and I saw that a group of artists were uh, uh, exhibiting some of their work and uh, work on the history of their countries on the basis of daily objects. And this was a source of inspiration uh, to me. I could see uh, the link with my culture. So I, I went home to Mali and I, I wanted to transmit this to other artists so that we could work on these issues, on our own history, our heritage, our values, and the history of these objects. So this is the result of that work. And this is the project that you mentioned, Rosario. The Nieleni project. So you've actually visited this exhibition now, haven't you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatumata. Thank you for helping us travel and uh, benefit from uh, this visit of your exhibition. Uh, uh, 
which we hadn't seen previously. So thank you, thank you very much for this contribution. I'll now move to the last part of our panel. And I will uh, thank. Uh, I would like to thank you all for this very interesting intervention. It is clear uh, that there is much to do to advocate for the protection of women artists, but also artists in general, as the point was made in terms of the intersectional approach to the protection of artists. And uh, we are nearing the end of our session, and I just have one question left to each of you, esteemed panelists. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your call to action? What is your key message to mobilize international support for the status of women artists, for the conditions of women artists? Um, in this uh, final sequence, uh, I will I will give um, the floor to each of you to just in in a, in very shortly to reply to this question, and I will start by um, the, the testimony of Mrs. Dia Khan, who, um, who has left us a, a response via video message. Thank you very much. I would just like to add that um, freedom of artistic expression for women is essential uh, because it allows them to express their thoughts, their feelings, their opinions, without fear of censorship and retribution. I think women have historically been silenced uh, or overlooked uh, in, in the world. And I think especially uh, minoritized women, women of color, including poor women, including women from rural areas. Freedom of artistic expression um, is particularly important for women artists because often their work deals with sensitive or what's considered controversial issues, um, issues that relate to their experiences of being in the world um, as women in, in male-dominated societies, male dom in, in a male-dominated world, not just specific societies. And I think it allows women to challenge societal norms and to promote change through their art. Um, so I think it's absolutely crucial that we promote and protect women's right to freedom of artistic expression. And I think because the right to artistic expression, I think, provides female artists with the opportunity um, both to share their experiences, but I think also to connect with others, other communities who are marginalized, or who are struggling, and through their artistic work, um, fostering a sense of community, which I think is so valuable for, for artists and especially women artists, uh, because it both allows for the development of their own craft, but also I think it allows for a diverse range of voices uh, and, and perspectives uh, to, be, to be allowed to come through. Um, so I think I would say for me, one of the most important aspects of, of, and the most important needs, I think, that women artists have is for their right to participate in artistic expression, for their freedom of artistic expression to be promoted and supported and protected. Thank you. Thanking Mrs. Khan for her words. I will now switch to Mrs. Golnar Shahyar to see what else uh, she has to say that she hasn't addressed yet since uh, she, her testing and her um, previous uh, interventions were so complete. Let's see what's her last uh, call to action or key messages. <laughs> Thank you so much. Obviously, I did not say everything uh, because I don't have the insight, obviously. And, uh, it's also not possible to mention everything in such a short time. But to summarize what I said, I think uh, it's very important that we change our perspective and priority or a gaze uh, about arts and music uh, um, not as a representation representation of power and hierarchy but as something that brings us together things that we already mentioned uh, as a healing tool as a, a space where we practice solidarity we practice trust I mean all the potentials are there uh, we um, um, 
it could be used or not. It could uh, the potential of arts could be used for all of the above that we talked about: representation, empowerment, trust, solidarity, healing, or not. It could be completely the opposite, and it could be actually used as a tool to recreate the same power structures. So we have to become aware of this, the reality, the potential of, of the arts and change our gaze. Um, yes, if we include more women who truly understand um, what it means to be marginalized, what it means to be suppressed, who have truly uh, experienced what it means not to have a chance to show who you are, we would, um, if, if we give more spaces to those people let it be women to this and we would have more uh, opportunity or chances to go to that direction because usually these people would work towards that goal of giving themselves the space but also share the space not necessarily though and again I, I emphasize that we have to recognize who are the community builders and who are the visionaries um, but really um, taking um, serious what the potential of art is in our society, which is the, the language of healing and coming together. And um, we did not talk so much about, uh, yes, we did actually talk about, talk about the uh, entertainment business, but I would like to um, emphasize the threat of um, um, commercialization and uh, capitalism that is also so in general, engulfing the human um, diversity of human expression. In general, it's it's a threat to um, everything <laughs> we have. I mean, it's and not all of it is bad, but many parts of it is. It's not only um, erasing the uh, diversity of our um, artistic ecosystem, but truly our diversity of our ecosystem uh, at the same time. Yeah, I mean. Um, again, I said it's very important that we talk about these things in a political level and that we create a foundation to make a sustainable system for the independent scene, which is pract uh, practicing diversity already uh, much closer than in the institutional level. We also need to uh, create spaces in, in the institutions, especially in the education system to integrate diversity uh, with all its complexity. And I truly believe uh, because we have a very, um, we have many resources here in Europe. We have money. We're not gonna get killed if we express our uh, <laughs> opinion. Um, so we have uh, the opportunity to empower communities here who could, possibly also empower communities somewhere else. I truly believe in this global solidarity. Um, I truly believe it could work because um, only through the people who understand those different com communities, we can connect with them because we cannot speak about cultures that we don't know. But if we have people who understand those cultures, if we empower them, we get closer to the reality of people we don't know. And maybe we under, also understand what their needs here, uh, are and how we could really help. Uh, this is also a very complex topic, I think. This, um, how to bring global solidarity. What is the, how, how is, what, what are the sustainable ways of global solidarity? This is maybe a topic of, to be discussed. I truly believe the communities in the diaspora could play a major role in empowering people over, uh, overseas who, are, who don't have these resources um, and so on and so forth. So I hope, I don't know, there's, there's so much to talk about, oh my God. And I truly believe um, it's really worth it if we do talk about it more in depth over a long period of time. And I hope that this continues. Thank you so much that I had the chance to, um, to be among you. And really, I, enjoy, I enjoyed all the, all the talks and, and, and your visions. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Gonar. Thank you also for bringing in the topic of the role of the diaspora, which we haven't uh, 
uh, discussed at, at length, at least during the, this debate. But as you say, there's so many dimensions to address that this is uh, an initial conversation, which we hope we to continue to have in other in future discussions. I, I will now turn to Mrs. Sahar Dekhan for your final some some final words from your side. Okay. <laughs> Final words. Um, I, I guess I would repeat myself probably. Um, I, I, I would like to add a, one thing is about education as well. Um, the education of young girls, because I mean, we are talking about women <laughs> on Women's Day, no matter how much I want to go beyond gender and, and include men in our talk. Um, uh, to be more united with men, um, there is one thing about girls' education that I, I, I think is very important: uh, is that we, yeah, we need to tell them that they can do anything they want and they can say anything they want and they should try. Um, I understand that in some countries they really can't, and so the the entire system should be changed. Um, but at least in countries where they can. Uh, it's really up to the parents, up to the teachers to to give them this access um, so they understand that they can follow their dreams and that they they even though it's not there yet, they don't yet have the same opportunities as boys do, as men will uh, later, um, that they, they should believe in it and they should fight for it. Uh, and in the arts, same thing, um, that they shouldn't compare themselves to to what men do and they should just go beyond their own capacity. Um, so that's what I try to, to share with young girls I know, um, either kids of my friends or, uh, some students I have is, is that's, that would be the message is to go beyond your own capacity and uh, not wait to be validated by others, not wait for men to accept you, which is for society to accept you or wait for financial support from a bigger organization, but just believe in yourself and always go beyond your own capacity. And I thought I already did that and I already knew that and I was doing great <laughs> until I saw the Iranian women today, the young girls of today. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> not only do they already know that, but they go so much more beyond that. And I'm just in awe and admiration of their power and artists included, because some of them are dancing on the streets and they got arrested and tortured for it. Uh, some of them are women rappers and they're creating incredible provocative rap songs in Iran um, and so on. I mean, I could go on forever and they're just fighters. And so I hope that men today that are already supporting us uh, continue to support us and that the men who don't yet uh, join us and that they, they realize that women do have incredible power and they can be complementary to whatever they're fighting for. And if we're all united, we can achieve things better together. And instead of spending so much time wor wor worrying about what we're wearing or what we're not wearing as women, the clothes we're wearing or not wearing, um, and whether we, are, who cares? Why don't they just stop shutting us down, stop hiding us, and just come together with us and let us express ourselves? Yes, through our art, yes, through our speeches. In either case, United, we will make so much more, and there is greater problems out there that we need to face. We need to face uh, fanaticism. We need to face power thirsty insane people we need to face economic crisis pandemic crisis we need to face global warming crisis all together united so stop hiding and shutting down the women let them express their art let them express advice for you and work with them yeah thank you for letting me speak today <laughs> Thank you for your closing words. So I shouldn't have said final <laughs> words because it sounded very somber. Uh, thank you for very inspiring and moving words from your part. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to listen to all of you, really. I will now uh, switch uh, Senora Shirley campbell Bar. Ms. Shirley campbell Bar, would you like to uh, say a few closing remarks, please? Thank you very much. Before I conclude, I'm just going to once again thank UNESCO for giving me the opportunity to be here today. 
But my closing remarks would focus on the need to uh, focus on how we've su survived because of art. Art has made our survival possible throughout centuries. It's helped us to help us uh, sustain ourselves and rise up, rise above. Art has always been there as a source of energy. It's something that goes from one generation to the next. It crosses borders. It, it crosses uh, oceans, and it brings people together. That is the most important thing to say. It's a way of getting connected. And today, on the occasion of the Interna of International Women's Day, it's essential that we bear in mind what we are commemorating. We have to understand that in a patriarchal system, this is something that is interwoven with the uh, artistic industries, and this is something why women are often are disadvantages. Disadvantages. Uh, we, in the developing world, say, have been producing art for centuries and centuries from the very dawn of time, and so we have to change the systems itself. We have to make sure that uh, what we change it into is something that doesn't hold us back. Uh, uh, this art is full of passion. It's something that is essential to life. Look at young people. Look at young women and girls today, and young boys and girls, too. They are breaking down all sorts of barriers. They're inventing things anew, things that we ourselves could not break down. You were mentioning what was going on in Iran. They're dancing in the streets. They're rapping. They're being arrested. But so what? So what? They keep going out to the street and go down in the street to express themselves through art. That's very, very important. Poverty in our countries has uh, names, last names, uh, colors, uh, smells even, and territories. But young people, boys and girls, are still going down into the streets declaring that they are there. They exist. These new generation understands that culture and art transcend time and space. It's something that just is, and that's something that we have to focus on. We have to actually demand support from our states. We need resources. It's an, indus it's an industry, after all. It's something that hasn't always produced the benefits for the artists themselves. But here we are. We're raising our voices. And it's very important, as Sarah was saying, to recognize the fact uh, that people will still do this. Young boys and girls, youth, children, they're constantly getting involved in art, in forms of art that uh, didn't exist when we were around. So art is very much alive, and it's, and it's a great thing. And so we have to continue to hold up the banner and demand that this patriarchal system that has kept us in period in positions of uh, inferiority and disadvantage uh, to change, to change. And it's very important to do this. Uh, so this is the way that we can rewrite our stories, and that's what we're trying to do day in day out day in, day out. You know, and rewriting our history from in different uh, artistic uh, media, not just in literature, but in painting, in dancing. And it's something that is a responsibility for all of us through art. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Campbell Barr, for your very enthusiastic participation in this conversation. As uh, you've rightly described, it does transcend oceans and generations. It's interesting that you focus on how artists were much alive. So thank you very, very much for that contribution. And now I'm going to give the floor to Madam Fatimata, Fatimata Diabate. If you would like to make some concluding remarks, please. Madame, you must uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, is it working now? Yes, it is. Well, I was just saying that it's been a, a great pleasure for me to participate in this panel discussion. It's been great to, to connect with fellow artists. Thanks to UNESCO for giving us this opportunity to speak on International Women's Day and to focus on the issues that women artists uh, face in their daily lives. I haven't understood absolutely everything, but I think that there are many, many recommendations that have been made that are very important. So I would just like to add one. 
is that f financial support is essential for because we're not just artists. We're mothers, we're wives, we have many other hats that we wear. And so for an artist who follows her discipline with full passion, she does need some financial security, a financial safety net, and other forms of support. This is something that um, is essential. Also, providing outlets for creative people. That's where it's, my work as a photographer has actually made it possible for me to continue to do this because I've managed to get uh, some of uh, these commissions to do coverage of certain issues, and they've provided me with some financial assistance, working with the United Nations, etc. And that's great because it helps me support my family, my children, etc. Another thing, I mean, that really is the most important thing that I could stress. I hope that this panel discussion will uh, be of benefit for all of us. Uh, and I'm grateful to the other participants and panelists for all of their input. So thank you very much for the invitation to exchange with you all. It's been a great experience. And hopefully, uh, we'll be able to meet uh, again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatumata. At the end of our panel, I would like to thank all uh, and applaud all panelists. Uh, and thank you all viewers at home for following this discussion. I would like to invite you all to think about it today and to celebrate the women artists and cultural professionals who, through their creativity, have been contributing to create more resilient uh, societies, especially during the ongoing crises around the world. Today's session will be closed by, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, by a performance by Iranian singer Mrs. Niaz Nawab. She's a, a, a multi-instrumental musician, as I said before, singer, songwriter, composer, and music teacher, who has kindly accepted to share with us a performance of three songs. This has been um, possible thanks to the partnership. Maintenant, je vais changer en français. Alors, la switch to French. Mia Naz Navab's presentation is possible thanks to cooperation with the Paris 3 Sasson Music Factory, and we're very pleased with this uh, collaboration. And before the presentation, I would like to give the floor to the founder of the First Ascent uh, Paris Music Factory, Mr. Said. Uh, he wants to speak to us briefly, so I'll give you the floor, sir, very quickly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rosario, and thank you, UNESCO, for this interesting panel discussion. All of the participants provided us with high-quality input and food for thought. Thank you very, very much to them all. In fact, this panel discussion has made it, in fact, clearer to me to what extent we as men have to support the struggle that women are engaged in for equality and for freedom. Because the women's combat for these things, uh, in fact, is the mirror image of our own freedom. We men are also burdened by the historic weight of this inequality. Now, today, I'm very pleased that in my country of origin, Iran, we are going through a very important social upheaval thanks to the struggle of these young Iranian women. They've shown their bravery, their courage, they've managed to bring together men as well, and people across different generations, different cultural milieus, different regions in the country. The Baluch, the Kurds, the Turks, all of them together. And this is the first time in the history in which we've seen our country engaged in such a movement of freedom seeking bringing together everybody around this hub of these young women engaged in this struggle. I would like to just tell you that there is a group that we've set up called the Barayé Collective, inspired by the Barayé song. 
that has become uh, the hymn of this revolutionary movement. And with my colleagues and artists, including Sahar and Golnar, greetings, uh, my friends. Uh, you were involved in the first performance of this. I would just like to see how this uh, ties in with uh, the uh, with France Television and their programming, because up until I think up until June, until you'll be able to see a replay performance of how artists from around the world be they Iranian, French, uh, from other countries, from the African continent, Latin America, etc. They have all came to support the movement of Iranian women. I think that we are all clearly, keenly aware now that this movement goes beyond Iran's borders. It's a very important lesson. It's the first time in the history of revolutionary movements in the world in which the women are at the forefront uh, while at the same time bringing everybody together following their lead. So that's my first announcement. The second one is that we will have another concert evening with artists from around the world on the 17th of April next at the Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris. If you're in Paris, uh, it will be a pleasure for me to welcome you on that occasion. Thank you very much again, once again, to UNESCO and to all of the panelists. Also, Fatoumata Diamate, I invited her in 2012 to our film festival when she uh, came out with her fantastic uh, disc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sadi. I hope that we can go on with the web stream at past 6 p.m. because we're now going to show you Niaz Novab's uh, show. We can all enjoy it together. Thank you and goodbye. من با تو هم ای رفیق با تو همراه تو پیش می نهم گام در شادی و غم شریک هستم بر جام می تو می زنم جام من با تو هم ای رفیق با تو دیریست که با تو عهد بستم با تو همگام تو هم بکش به راهم هم پای تو هم بگی دستم پیوند گذشته های پر رنج اینسان به تو هم نموده نزدیک هم بند تو بودم زمانی در یک قفص سیاه و تاریک رنجی که تو برده ای زقولان بر چهر من است نقش بسته زخمی که خورده ای ز دیوان بنگر بنگر که به قلب من نشسته زردی نه سفید نه سیاه نه بالاتر از نژاد و از رنگ تو هر کسی و ز هر کجایی من با تو تو با منی هماهنگ من با تو هم ای رفیق با تو من با تو هم ای رفیق با تو همراه تو پیش می نهم گام در شادی و غم شریک هستم بر جام می تو میزنم جام من با تو هم ای رفیق با تو دیریست 
که با تو احبستم با تو هم گام تو هم به کشم رو هم هم پای تو هم بگی دستم بیونده گذشته های پرن این سان تو هم نمونه نزدی هم بنده تا بودم زمانی در یک خفص سیاه و تاری از 
ازش بخنده تو مر ان ریویر دو ریق سانگلو سمر نداده رو چجور میشه بل کنم سوارم پیاده رو چجور میشه بل کنم گیرم جهان یک وطنه مرزای علکی رفیق و خانواده رو چجور میشه ول کنم بابوسه میخم کن بی خین دیوار که سفر ناکم اصله ایم استم روی این آوار من خطرناکم جای همه خالی شراب پایانو بزن به لیوانم سلامتی همه تمام ایرانو بزن به لیوانم با بوسه میخم کن بیخ این دیوار که سفر ناکم اصله ایم استم روی این آوار من خطر ناکم 
روی همه خالی شراب پایان و بزن به لیوانم سلامتی همه تمام ایران و بزن به لیوانم Magnifique, bravo. <rire> merci, euh, merci, euh, par, euh, merci Nias pour euh, cette euh, super euh, performance. Je crois que Fatoumata, vous voulez ajouter quelque chose Je vois votre euh, que vous avez la main. Oui, en fait, j'aimerais bien quitter la réunion si ça ne vous embête pas parce que je dois conduire les gens dans mon expo. Pas de problème, peux... la réunion maintenant, c'est je... les... on va clôturer officiellement la réunion. Merci encore okay. à toutes et on espère Merci. rester en contact avec vous pour, pour l'avenir, pour des autres avec... discussions. Uh, sorry, I, I will switch to English. We, we have avec to, gra avec uh, grand plaisir pour moi. To remain in contact with all of you. Shirley, esperamos de, de, de quedar en contacto para continuer estas discussions. Merci à Sadi, merci Saïd à Sadi pour uh, la collaboration. Et merci à tous à bientôt au revoir à bientôt merci Je au revoir I will close uh, officially this excellent discussion goodbye everybody okay, and merci goodbye to everybody, everybody who's bye followed bye. at home bye bye, bye. Sahar was <laughs>